Right, Ahmed and Wilson, you guys are the chair, so you can alternate in between. So uh, we can start with Wilson to present the uh, first talk in, let's see, two minutes. And you're the moderator at the end of the talk. Please ask the audience if they have any question or something. Yeah. All right, so the first talk of the session is going to be by DJ Price, titled Developing Wolfram Demonstrations Projects mm -hmm. for the Control of Wave and Beam Equations. You can start anytime. I think we still have one minute, but yeah. Yep. So begin when you're ready, but it's going to start at 940. Yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So thanks, Wilson. Uh, like he said, I'll be talking to you about developing Wolfram demonstration projects for the control of wave and beam equations. Um, so I'm DJ Price. Uh, this was supervised by Dr. Ozer. Um, and I, all of the talks in this session were, were supervised by Dr. Ozer. Um, and so let me give you an outline of what I'll be talking about. So I'll give you an introduction um, why studying this sort of stuff that I'm about to talk about is important, why it's relevant, why it's interesting. Um, I'll talk about the PDEs that we looked at, the approximation models um, that I had to look at and understand, and then the demonstrations that uh, were built from that. And so, <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of math in this talk, but my primary role on this portion of the project was, was programming. So I'll go through a lot of the math, um, but I'll spend a good bit of time showing you the demonstrations and showing you the projects um, and showing you the code. So an introduction here, what, what are we trying to do? Um, what are some applications of this? Well, we're trying to study vibrations in materials, essentially. And We'll get more into that as we go into the talk, but why is looking at vibrations important? Why is that something that's relevant? There's a material, um, a certain piezoelectric material, such that when it bends, it will generate electric charge. And when you put electric charge on it, it can bend. Um, so it's a really neat little material. The interesting part of it, though, is that when it moves, um, it will generate electricity. So what are some applications of that? Well, you've got sidewalk pavements um, here on the left picture. The idea there being that when you walk on the sidewalk, you're generating vibrations. You're, you're moving things on the sidewalk. And um, you can pick up those vibrations from, from walking and capture that as electrical energy and then use that, store it, whatever. So, so a concept of artificial trees. So the picture in the middle, you can see little plastic looking leaves. When those things move, they generate electric charge. And then you can use that again, store it, use it for whatever. And then railroads uh, can put a material underneath a railroad, it works the same way as the sidewalk worked. Um, it just, when the train goes over it, generate vibrations, generate things moving, and you can pick up that electric charge with this material. So studying vibrations is not only applicable here, um, but it's one really interesting application of it. And so our goal here is to accurately discretize PDEs um, for designing controllers. And so what does that mean? Well, we have some thing that's vibrating and we have things on the thing that's vibrating that is sensing the vibrations. And we want to be able to model that. So a numerical approximation of these continuous PDEs is actually modeling a physical system of trying to measure vibrations. And applications of known numerical techniques just fail substantially when we apply them to these PDEs. So we need a, we need a better method. Um, it's been shown that filtering by adding a filtering term uh, makes the equation much easier to solve. And then most of my contribution here was looking at the system of PDEs and their discretizations and, and they can be very complex and putting them into Mathematica, um, into the Wolfram language can take a long time to solve them. So a lot of the work here was to 
to speed things up to make sure things were happening in, you know in the correct order um, and that we were getting appropriate solutions for what we were doing. And so I'll go through and I'll, I'm going to show you the continuous versions of two PDEs and the discrete version of two PDEs of the same two PDEs. And then I'll get into the actual demonstrations of, of showing you what these things look like. So let u of x comma t describe some shape of a string. Um, so we have some string that's vibrating. And you notice there, if you don't have the k1 u sub t uh, term or the filtering term here in the red, that's just the normal wave equation, the regular wave equation that you might learn about in a, in a PDEs course. Um, the key thing here is that we're adding this filtering term. And I'll get more into this later, but essentially what happens with this filtering term is that as h goes to zero, it doesn't change the solutions, but it actually makes the problem easier to solve. And so we have some boundary conditions and some initial conditions. And so you can essentially think of the boundary conditions as we have it clamped at one side um, and it can move freely at the other side. Um, and then the initial conditions is telling us um, what the initial sighing wave look like, looks like, what the initial vibrations look like. And so we got four parameters, K1 through K5, but not K2. I'll get into where that comes in later. And those are the, the following terms there. And as I said, I'll explain H a little bit later. We have a similar, kind of similar looking PDE for um, the bending of the center line of a beam. So not just a string, but a beam. We have the exact same filtering term here. And we have hinged, hinged conditions on this, which means that the beam is attached at both ends and that it just vibrates up and down in the middle. And like last time, we have some initial conditions. Notice, I didn't mention this in the last slide, but notice at the initial condition, we have u of x comma zero equals 10 to the minus three times sine. What that means essentially is that these are very small vibrations that we're modeling, that we're trying to detect. Um, so these equations are non-dimensionalized, but we're looking at very, very small vibrations. And so we have a few different parameters here too. We have D1 through D5, not including D2. Again, it, you might expect there to be a D2 here or a K2 in the last example. I'll get into where that, um, that parameter comes in here in a minute. And we have two different kinds of beam models depending on if alpha is zero or not zero. So I'll talk quickly about what the discretization actually looks like. Um, so what, how do we take some continuous curve and approximate it? Essentially what we do is we define some, some step value. So we call that either H or we call that Delta X. Um, those terms are kind of interchangeable. We have some length of a string. So from the string goes basically from zero to L. And then we define a number of nodes. So we want n plus two nodes, start at x of zero, go to x of n plus one. And then our step size is L divided by n plus one. And so what that allows us to do is we discretize the equation in space. So remember it was u of x comma t. So that means we have one dimension of space and one dimension of time. What we do is we discretize this PDE with respect to space. And so at each point in space, we have an approximation of the curve. And we rewrite our PDEs, discretize them based on this scheme. And you can see some notational help here where we say, you know, u of x sub j comma t is u sub j of t, just to make, make the notation a little bit, a little bit easier to look at. And so once we do that, um, we use the central 
difference here for the uh, second spatial derivative, the second spatial partial derivative of u. Um, note that two other options is we could try to apply forward difference and, and backward difference methods here um, to approximate the second derivative. Uh, but it just turns out that the, the central difference formula makes things much, much easier. And it has to do with, with the amount of nodes we have and where, where the nodes are. Um, but this is what that discretization looks like for the wave equation. And again, note that we're using the central difference formula here. And we can add on this filtering term. So this is where the K2 option, the K2 parameter comes in. K2 is either zero or one. And so what K2 represents is, are we filtering the equation or are we not adding that filtering term? Um, and so what I'll show you later is the advantage of having K2 being set to one and not having it be set to zero, how much it helps solve the equation. And again, we use central difference to approximate the fourth spatial derivative. We have some fictitious nodes um, because to, as we iterate over the values of X, when we're calculating that fourth spatial derivative, we end up needing an X sub negative one and an X sub N plus two. Um, and so we define those kind of naturally. Um, X sub one is actually the negative of, or excuse me, u sub minus one is actually the negative of u sub one. Um, essentially you can think you have like u sub zero and u sub one up here. And so u sub minus one is back here and it's kind of this natural um, condition there because the beam is hinged. And we apply the uh, filtering term here, just like we did before. And this time we, use different letters, but D2 does the same thing that K2 did. So it's either zero or one. And so as we increase the number of nodes, remember I said that H was equal to L over N plus one and N was our number of uh, nodes. So as N increases or equivalently as H goes to zero, then that results in having more nodes to look at, um, which means it gets closer and closer and closer to the continuous problem. And so part of the problem that I was responsible for addressing in this project is looking at, you know, speeding that up, trying to figure out how many nodes we could have, what we could do if we had more nodes, things like that. And so with that, I'm going to start looking at the actual Wolfram demonstration projects themselves. I'll click this here just to show you um, that these are available online. So this is the, the novelty of a demonstration project with Wolfram is that you can make these things in Mathematica and you upload them to the web and anyone can look at that, anyone can download that, anyone can see the source code. So there's the wave equation one. And similarly, there's the beam equation. And so yeah, if anyone, if anybody would like the links to that um, afterwards, I'm happy to give that, but I think Dr. Ozer has also put that in the chat if you'd like to see that. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, I'm gonna show you this on my other computer uh, because the uh, computational effort between Zoom and presenting and everything else, I didn't wanna put that all on one computer. So let's see, we'll look at one of these first, if I can get it to share. Okay, great. So I'll just note real quick here before I actually show you the, the the, the simulation. Um, what all this hinges on is the ND solve method in Mathematica. Um, so essentially what we do is we build a system up, we give it some, the variables we wanna solve for, 
um, the amount of time that we're looking at it, and then some other options of, you know, how to solve this thing, um, how to make things a little bit quicker, and so on. And then it <clears throat> solves the system, gives us back our variables, and then we can interpret those and use those and do different things with them. Oh, I was looking at the wrong screen on my, my computer. Well, sorry about that, but <laughs> here's the indie solve method. Here's the system I just mentioned. Um, here's some stuff that, that we input into it to solve. So now I'll show you the simulation. Make sure this is evaluated. And so what we're seeing here, <clears throat> these two bottom graphs, um, the x-axis represents time. Um, so these things are already calculated throughout the entirety of the time that this thing is going to run for. <clears throat> and it shows the velocity at the tip over here on the right and the total en energy in the system. So what you can tell right away is that this is a pretty simple simulation because there's not a lot of energy in the system. The tip velocity goes to zero pretty quickly. What you're seeing up here is the actual wave that I was talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the left, we have this clamped to the to a wall. So this is an actual wall is what that's supposed to represent. And on the right here, this is just a fictitious box to help you see what, what's actually happening and see it moving. And so what I've got here is this is currently not filtered. So K2 would be zero in this case. And I have a lot of these parameters set pretty low. And so what I'll do real quick is I'll run this and it's a little jagged, but you can see that it quickly smooths out, right? So if I'm considering this time as seconds, it takes you know a little over a second to, to come to a resting position. If I add the filtering term to this, starts in the same place. And what you'll notice is that just over a second, it also comes to rest. So great. Well, it seems like nothing really changed. So what's the benefit of this filtering term? Well, when I started this, it's a pretty simple curve. I mean, it just goes up a little bit. But what would happen if instead I cranked up this parameter as high as it would go. So that now it's in a very, you know, chaotic initial position. And K5 represents the initial velocity at each of those nodes. So I'll crank that up as well. And now if I step through this time in a non-filtered solving method, It actually just never comes to rest in the amount of time that we've given it. If I go back to my filtered method, and you can see, even from the graphs down here, you can see that this is a much less chaotic system, and this is what we expect to see. And it takes, you know, four, a little over four seconds, maybe even three seconds there to, to get rid of all that chaotic motion. that is the benefit and the strength of using that filtering term um, because that's what we expect for this thing to do. Now I'll also show you the beam equation. Okay. So for those of you savvy with Mathematica, I'm quitting the kernel so that there's no Mathematica basically uses one big global store of variables and making sure that no variables are overwritten from the other notebook stuff. So we've got a very similar setup. We've got um, using the ND solve command here as well. 
with a system and some variables, except now we're using D's instead of K's and some other code to make this look nice and, and display it properly. What we're seeing here is the graph on the bottom is actually the, the velocities at each one of these discrete points. And you can see the beam here is hinged at both of these walls. And so here I'll quickly go through the same thing is if everything here is pretty simple, then what the beam looks like without any filtering. If we add the filtering, beam even stabilizes really quickly in very simple initial conditions. Okay, now let's say we turn the filtering down, make this thing look quite a bit more chaotic in the beginning. And now what happens? We don't, any, don't have any filtering. And you can even see that huh, it's interesting that it looks like it was at rest there in the middle, um, but it actually wasn't. It's kind of a snapshot of when it was straight across. And you can even see these velocities. DJ, you, you got about you got about another minute or so. Okay. You can even see these velocities down here are, are a little bit chaotic. And if I turn up uh, my filter, you can add the boundary damping as well. D three. If you increase that one, that's gonna solve the problem. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So as I step through this with the filtering method applied, then this settles out pretty quickly. And again, that's what we expect to see. So that for these projects, that was what I was mainly responsible for. And if you stick around for this session, you'll hear a lot more math instead of programming, um, which is also very interesting. And then I can get the slide to progress. We'd also like to just recognize uh, the NSF and uh, the EPSCoR grant, I was funded by the NSF for this project. Um, so I'd like to recognize them and thank them for that. And so that concludes my talk. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, DJ. Uh, this is a good talk. So we're gonna turn it over to uh, you guys. If you have any questions for him, you can put it in the chat box or uh, unmute yourself and ask your question directly. You also worked on a three-layer beam project, I remember. We couldn't finish that one, but um, can you explain that ins and outs, if you remember, what was the hurdle with the three-layer one? So, because I couldn't go back to that project again, so. Yeah, the so the project that Dr. Oz is referring to, there was, um, so that one that I just showed you, the very last one was a, a single beam layer. Um, and the three-layer beam is a beam with three different layers. And so you can imagine how much more difficult um, that equation might be to solve because of all the different you know, couplings between the layers and, and um, how many more interactions there are because there's, it's a much more complicated system. Um, and so yeah, the biggest problem was just trying to get it to run quickly. I mean, we couldn't use very yeah. many nodes. Um, it was difficult to find a, a quick solving method in, in Mathematica. Um, so that, that was the biggest thing up. It's just, it's a very complicated system. For, for that one, in fact, yeah, the top layer and bottom layer can move in this direction like that. And the middle layer is a viscoelastic layer and it, it has its own damping in it, like a sponge type material. I think the, the main hurdle was, one thing was like the, to visualize that. I think you managed to visualize that in the demonstration side, but yeah, the solver was working slowly. So if yeah. any of you uh, is interested in continuing with that project, Maybe DJ will be interested. She, she, he's going to be still around anyway. If, if he's still interested and if you want to work with him or with me on that project, just let me know. So any other questions? I, I have one quick question for mm -hmm. you. So, so in one of the first slides, the model that you chose took uh, the length to be equal to one. And so your C squared term, your wave speed for your wave equation was one as well. So was there, was there an issue trying to get your 
length anything other than one? Was that a programming issue? Uh, well, it wasn't an issue because we never tried to get anything else than one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it, the, the good news is, by the way, DJ, the good news with choosing the wave speed one and the length one is that we can always convert the PDE into a non-dimensionalized form, and we can make those coefficients one, in fact, the wave speed and also the length of the beam. So that's why like any, any wave equation can be transformed into what DJ put in the code. So mm -hmm. especially just one dimensional wave equation. Yeah, I think DJ, yeah. I mentioned that quickly too. I had the, the 10 to the minus three term and I mentioned that uh, the equations were non-dimensionalized. And so what that was meant to represent is just that the vibrations are really tiny. Um, yeah. So yeah. Because that model corresponds to uh, small vibrations. And if you want to include the larger vibrations, then there's a non-linear model taking care of uh, those vibrations. And that, that's a different model, in fact, to work with. So engineers decide which one to use based on what kind of vibrations they experience. And once they spot it and they design the controller the way DJ did in the code. Any other questions? <laughs> How fun was the demonstration project when you were working on it, DJ? <laughs> uh, it was, I, I really like Mathematica a lot. So I, I enjoyed working on it. Um, and it's really cool to, to be able to open up a website and see something that I did on the website. Um, and of course, you know, that's on my resume. Both of those projects are on my resume. I think that, I just think it's really interesting. Um, and it very clearly shows, um, kind of similar to a publication in a sense, because it does go through that peer review process. Um, so it's, it's really cool to see that. It's really fun to work on. But the, another cool thing is like, there's some demonstrations or simulations done in MATLAB, but MATLAB is not free, obviously. And it's done by a Spanish group of researchers. So in, in Wolfram's website, the two that you mentioned, the beam equation and the wave equation are the only ones in in understanding the control theory for string and beam equations. That's interesting because I was thinking like somebody else may have done this, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but nobody. So that's why the referees were happy that we were submitting something in control theory of partial differential equations topic. So they're happy about it. So. Cool. Yeah, I can remember. Um... When, when I was working on it a little bit, you would have, you were having me go through and try to find mm -hmm. similar projects on there. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't find like, like some aspects were a little similar, but like the problems we were encountering weren't something I could Way harder, find yeah. a reference for. The, the point is like, we're trying to control the whole system. I mean, DJ probably didn't mention that much, but we're trying to control the system, stabilize the system through one, uh, one point, essentially in the boundary, the boundary damping. So you inject the damping from there, and then you control every single vibration on the beam. That's the power of that, rather than applying distributed damping all over the string or beam. So um, that makes the calculations harder. Um, that's why. And the reason, by the way, why you got weird results when you increase N and uh, initial displacement uh, frequency, because if there's no filtering, everything messes up. In fact, in the, in the theory side, theoretical side of that, nothing messes up, but that's the defect of the uh, mm -hmm. numerical technique we apply uh, if, if, if it's without filtering. So you're not really mimicking the dynamics that's supposed to be there. So that means numerical analysis is sort of like playing with fire. You gotta be careful. <laughs> so, you decide. All right, well, if there's no other questions. We'll thank DJ um, for his good talk. Um, so, so Emma's going to be presenting today um, in control theory, uh, kind of what for anybody that was here before, similar to what DJ did. All, all these presentations in this panel are going to be similar. Um, and and hers, her title is Proving Numerical Observability for a Finite Element uh, Discretized Wave Equation. And so Emma, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you very much. So today I will be presenting my research with Dr. Ozer on proving the numerical observability for a finite element discretized wave equation. So first off, I'll introduce you guys to the continuous or partial differential equation model. Um, so this is our model. We have a string that is clamped on both ends. 
and u of x t models the vibrations on the string and we have an observer at the x equals l end of the string uh, that measures the slope of the tangent line at the end of the string. And so then this is our energy for the solutions where this ux term is our potential energy and this ut term is our kinetic energy. And one of the results we find is the conservation of energy. So energy at any time is equal to the initial energy. Uh, and so then we let v equal to this vector u, t, u, u, t, and a is this matrix of operators, um, where i is the identity operator and dx squared is the um, second um, partial space derivative. So then we're able to rewrite the PE as a first in, um, in the first order form, that you see there. And then we get this theorem. So the observer is going to wait t seconds to measure the quantity, which is this term right here. It's the slope at the end of the tangent line, or this is the slope of the tangent line at the end of the string. And so this theorem is just saying that um, let the observation time t be greater than two times the length of the string, and there exists some constant, um, some positive constant c, uh, such that for every solution in this function space, um, the inequality holds, so the observation is greater than or equal to c times the energy. And so for the proof of this, we use the multiplier um, x ux, so we multiply um, the equation in the system by x ux, we integrate by parts, and then we can simple, or yeah, we integrate by parts and then we can simplify using the boundary conditions and Young's inequality. So because this is a PDE, it has infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and this is our eigenvalue problem for the system. Well, in the past, I have worked through these results and solved the, for these before for the purposes of my you know, honors thesis and for this presentation, I'm just going to cite the results from Ryan's paper. Um, I believe Ryan will be speaking next after me, so um, the details for that might be in there. And so the discrete model. So we use the finite element method to discretize the system. And so the first step in this process is to convert the strong or the PDE form uh, to the weak formulation. And so what you do is you multiply the equation by phi, which is just this um, strong test function that satisfies the boundary conditions. And then you integrate by parts. And what that accomplishes is it shifts one of these x derivatives from the uxx term over to this test function. And so then we partition the interv um, interval into subintervals um, with the mesh parameter h equals to L over n plus one. Then we define our uh, basis functions as hat functions or piecewise linear splines. Um, and you can see um, that down here. And so here's a sample graph of the, these splines for n equals to five. And so these splines form a basis with basis functions phi i for i, equal, for I from one to n. So then we can rewrite the weak form as such. And then we can approximate this weak solution by the sum of linear combinations of phi i that you see here. So then our next goal is to estimate or to determine these scalar coefficients. And so we do that by substituting this approximation back into the weak formulation and letting phi i be equal to phi j for j from one to n plus one, one at a time. And then that allows us to rewrite the system as you see there at the bottom. And so then we, we, uh, we can use the orthogonality of the Galerkin basis functions, which that's just Galerkin basis, uh, the Galerkin method is just how we define our basis functions. And so we know that these two integrals are only non-zero when i and j are equal or they only differ by one. And we also know that um, they're not orthogonal to each other. So the details for solving for these, um, I have worked through this before, but again, for the purposes of like, lack of time and for the purposes of the paper and this presentation, we're just gonna cite the results from Emmerich Swan's um, senior thesis. And it shows these results here. And so from this, we can rewrite the weak formulation in this discrete form. And the energy for the system is given here. And so then we can take that and put it into a, a as a maker, we can rewrite it as a matrix equation where this is our M matrix and this is our AH matrix. And then from there, we can, like with the continuous case, we can put it in the first order form that you see here, or this is now a um, matrix. Ma this is no longer a matrix of operators. This is um, the, ident the identity matrix and M inverse AH matrix. So this is the main eigenvalue, um, eigenvalue problem for the system. And the details for finding that can be found in the, uh, um, 
in fun days was what paper cited in the references but for the purposes of this talk and my paper um, we, we're just looking at two auxiliary problems um, so the first is we're looking at the eigenvalues of the AH matrix and you can see those here those are again in the Infante Zwazwa paper and they are also um, you can also be found in Sydney News um, senior thesis and so the second sub, sub problem we're looking at is this one here and so this is the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix M inverse AH and so from Emmerich Swan's uh, senior thesis you can uh, we have this, and so you can see that they're directly related to the eigenvalues um, of that AH matrix. And so we can plug that in and find these eigenvalues that we need here. So this top row of graphs um, is the are the eigenvalues of the PDE uh, finite element and finite difference methods. Um, so you can see that the red, the PDE case, that's a, that's very linear. But for the finite difference and finite element cases, it levels off. Um, and then these, this bottom row of graphs is the gap between two consecutive eigenvalues. And so you can see for the PDE case, this is constant. But when you look at the finite difference and the finite element method, this goes to zero. So the observer at the end of the string is not going to be able to differentiate between these high frequency eigenvalues and the system isn't going to be observable. So now we're going to actually prove this lack of uniform observability. So first off, this observation term from the PDE, uh, we discretize it, as you see here. And so then we have this theorem that for any observation time greater than zero, we have that the supremum of the initial energy over the observation goes to zero as h goes to zero, where again, this is your energy. So we're going to prove this by counterexample. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, u to be the solution associated with the nth um, eigenvalue and eigenvector that you see here. And from there, the observability inequality states that there exists some constant C such that the energy is less than or equal to C times um, the observation as H goes to zero. Then our goal then, but if, when proving by counter example, we just show that some finite C here does not exist. Uh, in other words, C and T go to infinity as H goes to zero. So we're gonna start off, we're gonna take our energy um, or an energy equation, and then we're going to use this fact um, from the eigenvalue problem that um, psi nj prime is equal to i times square root lambda n um, psi nj. And then we, so we can plug this in here. And this is what we get. And so this gets rid of that um, time derivative there. And so what we, our next step is going to be we want to rewrite this, lamb, this first uh, lambda n term um, in the same format as this box equation here. So we're going to need this lemma to do that. And so this lemma um, is just stating um, that our potential energy is equal to lambda times our kinetic energy. And so uh, for this proof, we use the multiplier psi j, and then we can expand and simplify um, summations to get the result that you see. And so when we, when we use that result for the nth eigen pair, we plug that in, and you can see we're able to write the energy in terms of potential energy. The next thing we're going to need is this next lemma that um, states our potential energy in terms of the observation and also that uh, lambda in h squared goes to 12 so h goes to zero and the proof for that's kind of technical so i'm not going to get into it here um, due to the lack of time and so then we can use this result again for the nth eigenpair and be able to write our discretized observation in terms of the energy so that allows us to write the energy over the observation, which if you recall, that's what we're taking. We need to take the supremum of, and we, we need to show goes to um, infinity. And so we can write that as this um, fraction here. And then um, letting h go to zero. Again, you can, um, you can see here that lambda nh squared does indeed go to 12. And so when we take the limit of both sides, we can see that the denominator of this side um, is going to go to zero, and it, that it, um, it's going to blow up to infinity which is exactly what we need. So there does not exist a finite um, constant. So how do we fix this problem? Well, what the wet method we use is direct filtering from, from if you were here for DJ's talk, they, um, he used a method of indirect filtering. But what we do with direct filtering is we, after we set our um, number of nodes in, we choose our filtering parameter uh, gamma. 
such um, so that it tells us where we need to cut off and start cutting off these high frequency eigenvalues. Um, and ideally, this will be somewhere where there's not too much of a difference between uh, the eigenvalues of the PDE and the uh, finite element method. Um, and so um, you can see here we've got our uh, filtered solution space where uh, lambda nh squared is less than or equal to gamma. And so uh, because this is lambda nh, um, lambda kh squared, um, we know that gamma has to between, be between 0 and 12. So then we have our theorem for any gamma between 0 and 12. There exists some positive t dependent on gamma such that for any observation time greater than that t, there exists a positive constant c such that this, the same inequality holds. Um, and so there's this extra observation term popping up here, which I will come back to at the end and explain why that happens and how to avoid it. Um, and we also have these statements that as gamma goes to 12, our t goes to infinity, and as gamma goes to zero, t goes to 2l, which is optimal, but very unrealistic. And um, C goes to L over two times T minus two L, which that's the, um, that's the C from the continuous case. So now for the proof of this, um, we're gonna start off by letting capital Lambda equal to the square root of Lambda N. Then that allows us to write our um, solution as this, where mu K is equal to square root of Lambda K for K greater than zero and mu K is equal to negative mu negative K when K is less than zero. Then we can write the derivative of that as such. And so the next step is to find an estimate for this term here. Um, due to the lack of time, I'm just going to, you know, kind of give this to you. Um, it involves uh, plugging in this um, u prime and then using um, this relationship, these two relationships here, mu k is equal to square root lambda k and absolute value mu k is less than or equal to square root of capital lambda. And you're able to find this inequality here, which we will come back to later. So the next thing we need to do is we need to use this lemma here that is just writing our potential energy um, is equal to our kinetic energy minus this, um, this y term here. And so the proof of this uses the multiplier um, uj, we integrate by parts, and then we can expand and simplify summations. So we do it, um, well, First, uh, this is our energy once again. And so we take that equation from the dilemma. And so then we're gonna solve the energy for this term here and plug that back in. So then the next step we need is we need to use conservation of energy, um, which we, we prove again for the finite element method. And the proof of this um, uses the multiplier uj prime to show that um, the time derivative of the energy is equal to zero. So then when we plug, we plug in the, this um, conservation of energy of this EHT term becomes EH0, which is a constant. And the integral of the constant is just going to be uh, T times EH0. And then two times the rest of this is equal to what's on the other side of the equation, uh, this term. And so we can move it over and divide by two and we get this equality. It, yeah. So Yet, um, yet another important result um, is that we can write our observation term in this format. Uh, it's equal to all of this. And also we need this result here um, that allows us to rewrite this H over three term in terms of just the potential energy. And so when we combine those, we get this. And then we're gonna take that estimation for our, from earlier for that result. And we're gonna pull out this um, one fourth and because this is negative times this, we're gonna we flip the inequality. And so that gives us this inequality here. And we need to take this box term and put it in terms, uh, rewrite it in terms of the initial energy. And so we're gonna use that other result that we worked through and we're gonna plug it in and we're gonna obtain this result here. And so then we're going to factor out the, T, the TH terms and then we're going to rewrite um, these yh and xh terms in terms of z. So this is what we have here. Our observation is equal to this. And so then our goal is to estimate um, this is the h term and as, as the term of energy so that we can all absorb all of that. And so the, the proof of this is probably one of the most technical proofs of the entire paper. So I'm definitely not going to get into that here. 
but we're just going to um, take that result and that allows us to start doing this. So we have the absolute value of ZH from zero to T is equal to ZH of T minus ZH of zero, which by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to ZH absolute value ZH of T plus absolute value of ZH of zero. And then we, when we use this inequality, we get that it's less than or equal to two times all of this times the energy. So then we know that just that um, outside the absolute value, this difference has to be um, greater than or equal to negative all of this. So then we can take that, plug that result back in for this box term and find that our observation is greater than or equal to all of this times energy. And then we're going to let um, capital lambda equal to be equal to gamma over h squared and plug that in and we get a slightly nicer looking inequality here. And then we can recall that gamma is between 0 and 12 and therefore 1 minus gamma over 12 is greater than 0. And so we know that our energy less than or equal to our constant times our observation. Uh, we know that that's true provided that t is greater than all of this because that's what t has to be um, in order for the constant to be positive. So then we have our t and our c and these uh, lambda ones that are popping up are just this, the first eigenvalue. So then we can take some very simple basic limits. Uh, so gamma, as gamma goes to zero, um, and then we just plug it in and we find 2L. And as um, in addition, as gamma goes to zero for the C term, um, this goes to L over two times T minus 2L, which matches what we needed for the theorem. And then we, when we look at as gamma goes to 12, uh, we can see that this denominator here goes to zero and it all you know, blows up to infinity. And when we, when we look at the constant um, C, we end up getting a negative number and C has to be positive. And so as gamma goes to 12, um, a positive C does not exist. So the statements of our theorem hold. So coming back to this term here, um, this is just kind of an unavoidable byproduct of the multipliers technique. Um, the way to avoid that is to use something, something called Ingham's theorem instead, which is going to be one of my next steps for this project. Um, I, haven't learned, I haven't started learning about that yet um, oops. Um, because my next concern is actually designing stabilizing feedback controllers for both the finite element and finite difference method approximations. Um, because I did do um, these same results with the finite difference method approximation and both of these processes are we did by the multipliers method so we want to finish up using the the multipliers technique before getting into Ingham's theorem and then finally um, if I have the time at the end of the semester I will be working um, to develop a, a new um, demonstration project using these results so you know, DJ's project used the finite difference method, so mine would, the ours would use the finite element method um, and indirect filtering instead of direct filtering. And so um, if I have the time, I would love to get to work on that. So there's my references. Um, and thank you to WKU and NSF for the RCAP and EPSCOR um, grants that have helped fund this project. And thank all of you for your attention and your time. Does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you, Emma. Well, let's all thank the speaker. See we have... time. Yeah, it was a good time. Good, good time. We're right at 1034. So again, if you guys have any questions, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And we'll, we'll, we'll have about five minutes for questions. And if you need me to go back to a particular slide, I can I can start sharing again. Just let me know. Um, I, I, had, I had one question real quick. Comparing yours to DJ, um, DJ was also looking at the, the what, what we call the clamped free case. Yeah. And you were doing the clamped clamp case, right? Mm -hmm. So so you had a that different boundary condition, right? For when you discretize it, the UN minus UN plus one over H was uh, DJ's paper for his boundary condition. Um, that was the estimation for the, the UX at LT, right? And you had the 
U N over H or U X at L T, right? Uh, yes. Believe, right. Yeah. And and that was coming out of where? Um, which part? It was my question. That's a good uh, question. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Can you repeat that? I just I want to write this down so yeah. I can visualize so, what you said because it so, kind of. So, so so DJ had the had uh, the boundary condition clamped free, yeah. right? For, and, and his estimation for U X at L T was U N minus U N plus one over H, um, whereas you had the estimation for U X at L T as U N over H. So so I guess my question for you was where where did that extra U N plus one go? Or the difference in boundary. Um, yeah, it's it's because of the boundary conditions. So you said DJ had UN minus UN plus one over H, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so because um, that's a free boundary condition at the tip. Yours is clamped. Yeah, mine's clamped. So that so um, I believe the UN plus one becomes zero, and I think that's right. Uh, I think that's the one that's zero. And so um, yeah, that it's just it's uh, yeah the the yeah. clamped clamp case is a lot simpler than the clamped free. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah, because his, yeah, so that, that UN plus one term just becomes zero, so it's the little, yeah, the UN over H. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas his boundary in, conditions. In her case, the observation is U sub X, in fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. And then the, and then the other the other observations were the, was the tip velocity, and yours is the yep. the angle of the, the strength. So when you, when you use the same way that DJ did, UN plus one minus UN over H, UN plus one is zero because of the clamp boundary condition. So you have the modulo of negative un over h and, and the negative is gone because of the modulo that's why she has un over h in the obser observability inequality but that's a that's an awesome question so yeah and i get i had one follow-up question so you did both finite difference and finite element right you would kind of work yeah. through both of those so my, my question was which one was harder for, for you finite was, element was more uh, the finite element was just like i mean i mean i guess technically like in terms of time I spent on it, I spent more time on the finite difference method uh, because, yeah, that was my first time working through all this, like using the multipliers technique. And like, it, it's, it's the exact same process with the finite element method. It's just some of the calculations are a little harder. Hard. Like um, I mentioned um, the theorem to estimate the ZH term, like, um, but that was probably the most technical of them all. Like that one was so much harder with the finite element method than it was for the finite difference method. like. I think of all the I think of all the theorems like that's the one I've had the most trouble, or lemmas I guess that's the one I had the most trouble with like just w with the finite element method you add in. A you lot also of, like, have the kinetic energy term, right? That that has more components in it. That's the, yeah. the hardest part, yeah. right? Because yeah. in the finite difference, there's uj prime squared. That's your kinetic energy, right? Yeah. But in her case, like if you go back to that one of those slides, you can in fact show. Uh, do you want to show that the energy yeah. term? So the kinetic part is very complicated. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's just go back to where I defined the energy at some point. That makes the calculations harder. And, and that is the reason Emma pointed that out, but uh, that's the reason we had that junk term in the observation coming into the game at the end by the multipliers. Yeah. So yeah, this energy term, look at the kinetic energy, the first two ones, the first two yeah. uh, added. That's not the same in finite difference. So, yeah, it was a lot simpler with finite difference. Method. Like it, it took less time probably with the finite element because like I had like I was able throughout the proofs to reference the results I made um, from the finite difference method a few times and just be like, oh, okay, you can reference back to here for the to for the solution to this side of the equality, and here's how you did the other side. But like it was it was still like the calculations. Can you also say something about, I mean, you didn't put it in the presentation, but probably you're going to put it in your thesis. I think the control time, sorry, the observation time is slightly better when you have finite elements, which is like, when I say slight, the better, it's more realistic to the actual uh, continuous case. So can you say something about that? I think you were the one uh, looking at that. Um, it's not in your presentation, but at yeah, the was, end, there's a discussion. You know, saying like, you know, the observation time is better in finite element than finite difference. Maybe you didn't probably put it here. I don't want to put you on the spot for that, but. Uh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we've really necessarily done. Okay. A compa I don't think I've done any sort of comparison for that. I, I know you've mentioned it to me that it's better. Mm -hmm. 
but um we should probably add it to your uh yeah we somewhere should. just to compare you know but yeah i think i think we were yeah, yeah, yeah final term yeah. here like this t yeah like t that was going to be one of the the final parts of the thing like there was you yeah. kept telling me like oh, okay you see this comparison section at the end mm -hmm. of this paper you're going to do one yeah. of those as well so yeah we just haven't fully done that yet i think we were yeah. Okay. I don't know if we were waiting until after we've done the Ingham's method to do that, or I'm not sure. Even but. without the Ingham's, you can still compare the minimal observation times. Yeah. And, and as you see that if gamma goes to zero in 62, it's 2L, right? Yeah. 2L divided by the wave speed, which is very realistic with the continuous case. And then you can just compare the tail terms at the top from finite difference to finite element, saying like, you know, you get more realistic Observable time take a note somewhere we can come back to it maybe next week or after next week so yeah i think that, that's it all right are there any other questions let's thank the speaker one more time thank you emma thank you all and then the next up uh, should be ryan